truthfully, every great thing that happened in my business that pushed me ahead like a few years over my competition uh, was always after belly flop. I spent two years on Shark Tank being scared to death. What was really? I doing? Really? Absolutely. Most of the shots that you would see me in in season one or two, I looked like an executive secretary taking excellent notes. And then somehow in season three, I decided I didn't care enough to be nervous anymore. And I kind of came into my own. Is Kevin really a bad guy? He's a great actor. And you know what? He plays that part terrifically. He makes the rest of us look like nice people. I mean, what would we do without Kevin on the show? He's essential. Plus, were you and Donald Trump rivals? Rivals? He was my uh, best supporter, as I was for him. All right, the obvious. What do you mm -hmm. think of his run? If someone had told me to take that seriously a year ago, like so many other people, I would have found it laughable. Uh, but now I see that what he's doing in this run is exactly what he did best, building his business. He's building a brand. I'm trying to figure it out. Do you like him? I do I like him. Is there an honesty meter here? All next on Larry King Now. Welcome to Larry King Now. Our special guest is Barbara Corcoran, real estate mogul, business expert, and one of the stars of ABC's Emmy-winning series, Shark Tank. Her book is Shark Tales, How I Turned $1,000 into a Billion-Dollar Business. You only had $1,000. $1,000 then was a lot of money. That's like 10000 now. What, what did you do it for real estate? I used the $1,000 to start a real estate company. I was a waitress and got a lucky break because a guy came into the diner, gave me a ride home, he became my boyfriend. And six months later, he said, a girl like you would be great in real estate sales. Why don't you try that? And I did. And that's how I got started. What happened and to him? He, um, he was my business partner and my partner for seven years, and then he ran off with my secretary. And uh, that was a hard chapter. But of course, uh, things happen for a reason, and that got me in business for myself. And he ran off with the gift? Uh, he did, but that's okay, because he gave me a gift going out the door. He told me I'd never succeed without him, because I decided to end the business after a year. And uh, it was kind of like an insurance policy. I, I felt like I was going to succeed. I have been married a long time, two 22 children. 22 years, yeah, to Bill Higgins. Yeah. What does your husband do? He drives me crazy, mostly, OK? He never <laughs> listens to me. He's the only person I can't boss around. He. Uh, how, I don't even know how to describe him. And sadly, as badly as I treat my husband, everybody calls him poor Bill. They should be calling me poor Bar, but that's what's called a marriage. So how did Barbara Corcoran become Barbara Corcoran? I mean, the first time I met you years ago, and you were like the real estate queen of New York. Yes. How did that happen? Well, it happened in the same way every business happens. I worked my buns off every day of the week from the moment I started the business at 23 until I sold it at 50. And I think if you work really, really hard and you're really dedicated and focused, you uh, build a business. Isn't there still a Barbara Corcoran Realty? There's a Corcoran Group Realty, which is a business I founded, and it's doing phenomenally well. So I'm very You're not very involved happy. with them? I'm not involved because I sold that business 22 years ago. But think about this. I cashed out. If I hadn't cashed out on that, where would I get the money to invest on Shark Tank? <laughs> <laughs> Do you still sell real estate? Oh, not at all. No, I've invested in real estate over the years. Lucky for me, because New York City is an amazing market. And I really invest in real estate out of need of finding offices in areas that were up and coming. I always opened early. Uh, but those properties, interestingly enough, in the end became worth more than what my business was worth when I cashed out on it. Do you miss real estate sales? Um, I don't miss real estate per se, because that wasn't what my forte is. But what I missed immediately, and actually thought I had made a mistake, was I missed my team. I miss the people. I love real estate brokers. They're like wacky racehorses, if they're any good. Uh, they're difficult to manage, and they're eternally interesting. So that's the part that I miss. One of my best friends is the probably number one realtor in Beverly Hills. Mm, it's a good market to be number one in. Oh, and it's, it's booming. Mm. And uh, I always see the and joy. And there's so many divorces there. The houses turn over yeah. all the time, you know? The joy when you hand the keys over. Oh, yeah, until they find out what they didn't notice when they were doing the inspection. And then sometimes you hear from a buyer who's not so happy. But, you know, it's a great field because when you're finding homes for people, it's a really important piece and it's a joyful piece of living. And so you're very much part of that. Were you and Donald Trump rivals? Rivals? He was in a totally different business than I. He was my uh, best supporter, as I was for him, because he built the buildings and we sold the buildings. So that was a very, a very comfortable relationship, yeah. He was never a realtor, per se, right? He was never real. Well, I shouldn't say that. I think at one juncture, he opened Trump brokerage, but it didn't do well, and then he closed it. If I'm not, And I'm not sure I'm right on that, but I think I am. But no, uh, no, you need developers. Every time a crane goes up in New York City, I open a new office. I just, hey, they're building more products, so you need the developers. Did Trump own the building or just put his name on the building? Initially, he owned everything that he built. He would build Trump Tower. That was his first big building after the high end on 42nd Street, which he didn't own, I don't believe. But he owned Trump Tower. He owned Trump Plaza. 
Plaza. And then after that, his name became so much bigger than his business that he started having a range of kind of like leasing the name on a term. And I wasn't privy to how that worked, but that was the best arrangement of all. No risk and a high premium for the use of the name, the branding. So you've sold a lot of places in his we offices. We sold so many of his properties. My top agent, Carrie Chiang, who's a, a tycoon in her own right, sold so many properties at Trump Plaza and Trump Tower at a time when there was a recession that he gave her a birthday party, but had, uh, I think it was 138 candles on the cake to represent every sale she did. She was selling 70% of his product at that juncture when every developer in town would have loved to have the sale. All right, the obvious, what do you mm -hmm. think of his run? Well, Robert, it's mind-boggling, mind-boggling to me. If someone had told me to take that seriously a year ago, like so many other people, I would have found it laughable. Uh, but now I see that what he's doing in this run is exactly what he did best, building his business. He's building a brand. He's always been phenomenally good with media. He's always made everything look bigger than what it was. He's always promised the moon and then changed his mind halfway down the track. And so that's his MO. So he's running this campaign exactly how he built his real estate empire. I'm trying to figure it out. Do you like him? I do. I like him. Is there an honesty meter here? I respect his marketing savvy. He's phenomenal at it. He's, I'm sure you've heard everybody say he's a P.T. Barnum of our era, and it's definitely true. Uh, do I like him? Uh, no, I don't particularly like him because I don't like uh, things that he stands for, and I don't agree with many of his opinions. Let's just say I won't be having dinner with him tonight. What made it for you from that thousand dollars? What was the first? What made Barbara Corcoran a name? Was it a, a sale or was it what? No, it wasn't. You know what it was? I was in the midst of a real estate recession with no money for advertising. I was in business for myself for maybe five or six years. It was a terrible recession. Interest rates were 18%. So everything was wrong. And I was trying to figure a way to get publicity, not publicity, but to get some business into the company. And so I added up my 11 sales for the year, divided by 11, and came up with an average price. And out of pure naivety, I printed it as the average New York City sale price and put my name on it and sent it to everybody at the Times. And it appeared in the New York Times that Sunday on the front page of the real estate section, quoting me as the expert. That was a wake up call. I realized that's how the media works. And so I became an expert overnight when I was a real nobody in business <laughs> and almost going out of business. A fantastic Barbara Corcoran. Up next, Barbara on the secrets of Shark Tank. Stay with us. We're back with Barbara Corcoran. The book is Shark Tales, How I Turned $1,000 into a Billion Dollar Business. One of your fellow sharkers, Robert Herjavec, was a guest here, and he said if he had to trade places with one person on the panel, he'd, he'd trade with you. Why would that be? He likes you. He likes me? He never acts like he likes me. He's always making fun of me. And Damon John said the same thing. He oh, would trade well, places with you. Of course. I love Damon John. Why does Shark Tank work? answers a lot of needs and people sitting at home. It inspires people. Everybody wants to be inspired. I don't care what's going on in your life. It makes people think if only they could think of that one great idea, they're going to be rich. And then you watch it play out on TV where you get the ideal rich girl or guy who's going to invest in your business. It's got all the ingredients that make people think that anything's possible. And then people succeed. And they really do show that it's possible. It's a dream show. It's a dream show, but it's also very much a reality show. What you see is really what you get. How do you get on? You know what? It's a story of getting on the show and being fired before I got on the show. Because I got an inquiry from Mark Burnett Studios who asked me to be on. They wanted net worth statements. You had to be able to show that you could play the game. And then I signed the contract without reading it. And then a week later, I got a call. Sorry, we picked another woman. I couldn't believe it. So I sat down and did what I always do well, handle rejection. I'm great at it. And I sent Mark an email that was pointed, tell him I was how did I put it? I think I said something like, um, I appreciate you saying that I could come in second. He said he'd call me as a fallback. A fallback? How insulting. And I said, but I'm accustomed to coming in first. And I told him everything good in my life happened on the heels of rejection. Cited everything from childhood on up, four or five points. And I said, I wanted to be on that plane and compete for the seat, invite both women out. And that's exactly what he did. So I almost didn't get Shark Tank. And I have that email framed by my desk to remind me every time that somebody says no to you, you got to just get back up and ask for the job. Do you know the woman? Yes, I do, but I'm not going to tell okay. you. Why do you enjoy doing it? You know what I love? I love After Shark Tank. The show for me is enormously stressful. I take my money seriously because I've worked so hard for it. I want to make good bets. You can't make them all the time. But what I like is once I get a great entrepreneur, I get to live with them in their business world, to help them, to see them prosper, to see them dream, and to feel like you have a hand in it. Who wouldn't like to do that? How have you done? very well on have some you made businesses. Money on Shark Tank? Oh, of course I have. Yes. And you know why? Because the businesses that you do well in, so I have seven very uh, 
very profitable businesses, and they collectively are earning $67 million in Shark Tank, which is a lot of money. So those I do well in, but I also have 14 businesses I've done terribly with, and you lose your money there. But net-net, if you stay the course and you pick the right entrepreneurs, you can make a lot of money on Shark Tank. I didn't believe it in season one and two because I didn't know how to do it, but it took a while to get good at it. And now in the last five or six seasons, it's been terrific. Are you buying the product or the seller? Never the product. I couldn't care about the product. It's got to be reasonable that it makes common sense. But all I'm doing is picking salespeople, which is what I was great at at the corporate group and why I built a big business. Um, sitting there, sizing them up, and trying to figure out just a couple of things. Can they sell their product? Because we get lots of great businesses, but if you don't have a salesman, that business isn't going anywhere. And then the second thing I'm trying to hone in on, which isn't so easy, but I find a way of doing it, which is how good are they at taking a hit and getting back up? Because you know what I found? I found my great entrepreneurs. I'm missing a gene that my losers always have, which is my great ones take less time feeling sorry for themselves when things go awry, whereas my other businesses feel sorry for themselves, blame it on somebody else, and those are never the people that are going to succeed in business. They just don't get there. So I'm always trying to pick the entrepreneur who's a winner. What one didn't you get that you regret? What one has done um, super well? I don't have many regrets because the next one comes down the pike right into the tank so you're onto it. But there was one that I thought I had a deal. It was called Note Hall, and I don't remember what I paid for it. Probably, I'll make up the numbers, but let's say I paid $50,000 for a third of the business. Two kids out of college. It was actually a cheating app where the smart kid in school gets to sell his notes to the dumb kid in school. And because I was a dumb kid in school, mm -hmm. I related to that. But what happened was I asked them if they'd shop it around after we made the deal. They swore they wouldn't, but they shopped it around and sold the business. I think for $10 million within a month. That one got away, <laughs> but that was then, and the next one came in the next day. One of the other investors, Kevin O'Leary, will flat out tell people their ideas are bad and they should give up. Do you like that approach? It's needed for the show. Is Kevin really a bad guy? He's a pushover. He probably is the biggest pushover on the entire show as an individual and as an investor. So he's a role player? He's a great actor. And you know what? He plays that part terrifically, and he makes the rest of us look like nice people. I mean, what would we do without Kevin on this show? He's essential, but he's not what he's cracked up to be at all. The show is much longer than we see it, right? They spend more time with you. Usually an hour, hour and a half per pitch, and when you get to see it at home, what is it, six, seven minutes long? Yeah. Pretty quick. They do a great editing. I think so, yeah. More with Barbara Corcoran after the break. We're back with Barbara Corcoran. Her book is Shark Tales, How I Turned $1,000 into a Billion Dollar Business. One of your compatriots said that he would happily, Mark Cuban, run for vice president with either candidate. What do you make of that? Well, the idea that Mark would run for vice president is a great idea. He'd be a phenomenal vice president. He'd have my vote. Um, the idea that he'd run with either candidate is a little odd. I'd rather yeah. see him run with Hillary mm. because I think he'd be a perfect counter to Hillary. He's mm. zesty, he's aggressive, he could take uh, Donald Trump to task easily. He has more money than Donald Trump. That would bug the crap out of Donald, maybe even unsettle him in some way. Um, but uh, I can't imagine, uh, the only one that Donald Trump would run with, obviously, is Donald Trump. So I couldn't mm -hmm. imagine him making space. Couldn't if he imagine. has more than Donald, then Donald isn't worth 10 billion. Well, people say that, you know, but cash is cash. What Mark has is cash. Can't argue with cash. You came on this program after the real estate collapse. Mm. Where is it now? Well, we've certainly recovered from a real estate collapse. We've regrouped all the lost value, but we haven't gone that far past it. It just feels so good because of where we were. Beverly Hills is great. So Beverly Hills is great. New York City is great. All the hot markets are great, but the values aren't that much higher than they were at the peak. If what do you, you really mean? Examined. I don't follow. In other words, what we sold properties for in the premium areas of the country where you get the best money because everybody wants it, we haven't superseded those numbers that much considering how many years has it been since the recession? I don't even know. I forget about it now. How do I use your book? How can I learn from your book? Well, what's great about my book is the book is much about my mother as it is about business because my mother was simple-minded, but she raised 10 kids on a shoestring budget on a, in a two-bedroom flat. And she was an extremely practical woman. If she had been in business, she would have been filthy rich, I'm convinced of. But instead, she was a devout Catholic and wanted to have a lot of kids. But in the book, I use everything my mother taught us in very simple terms to build my business. And I literally did that. So it's a book that people really relate to. They, they get it. I don't care who you are. It's, so, it's told in parables. You've lived off rejection, too. Well, yeah, I you, know. I don't like rejection. No, but you react, you, it drives you. Well, you know what? Yes, you're right about that. Because for some reason, if someone insults me, I will kill 
to prove them wrong. I'm just, I don't know where, it's an insecurity, obviously. Probably something really went awry. But mm. yes, that gets me going, no doubt. Eugene Letterman wrote a book years ago called The Sale Begins When the Customer Says No. Boy, isn't that true. I Indeed. would agree, I should have written that book. I would have added, when the customer says no three or four times, you get warmed up. <laughs> but you know what, truthfully, every great thing that happened in my business that pushed me ahead like a few years of my competition uh, was always after belly flop and just looking at the other side and trying to think, how do I save face? How the heck do I get out of that, this pickle? And that was always the big idea that pushed me ahead. So I don't think you get the big idea without a lot of bumps, period. You want to play a little game of if you only knew. I just no, throw I don't some want to play yeah, with you. What play. do you think about that? Who was your childhood celebrity crush? I didn't have one. We weren't allowed to watch TV, period. Sorry, you, you sure you want to play this game? Okay. Secret talent. I'm a great party giver. From elephants to balloons to crazy freak shows to whatever, I'm a great party girl. Guilty pleasure. I buy a lot of flowers. I don't feel guilty. That's no. all I could think of. If you could trade places with someone for a day, who would it be? Hmm. Julius Caesar, right before he went down? See, <laughs> to hear that, that Brutus speech, maybe? <laughs> who knows? Business person you'd most like to guest judge on Shark Tank. A guest judge? I'd like to have Whoopi Goldberg on Shark Tank. She'd be a hoot. Come on. Something you're bad at. Um, I'm really, I'm really bad. <laughs> you run to what I'm bad yeah. at? I'm not so good in bed. I wouldn't say really bad, but not so good. <laughs> you judge yourself? At business. Of course I do. Who doesn't judge themselves? You're better in bed? at business than you are in bed. Oh, so much better. So, but your husband is smiling all the time, right? He is smiling. He's a happy man, yeah. He's, he, he doesn't get it. He doesn't know what, what's out there. <laughs> what's the number one thing that plagues most startups? Um, falling in love with a business idea and not asking the mother-in-law who hates you, what do you think about it? Because people fall in love and then they get all their family and friends to say amazing, amazing, and they never ask them to write a check. Ask them to pay for the product and watch what happens. Last time you were starstruck. Oh God, Mel Gibson on East 57th Street, 20 years ago. And when I saw him, all I did was say, you, 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 and grope for him until I grabbed him. It was so embarrassing. And all he did was gently push me aside and walk past and then I died. How stupid was I? Uh, last time you cried. You know, last time I cried was this morning and I hardly ever cry because I'm moving my apartment. I woke up at 5 a.m. for some reason, the light was coming in and I thought what a wonderful home we've had here. And I didn't want to move, even though I thought I really wanted to move. From where to where? Uh, just two blocks. I'm living on 94th Street. I'm moving to 97th Street, but I'm moving for a terrace. But this morning it didn't seem so important. I wished I could just stay where I was. Do you do your own real estate deal? I always do, yeah. In fact, it's not a good idea. You do your own real estate deal, you know what I've learned? You pay more, your emotion gets in the way. I overbid myself twice on this apartment I was buying. I went over two other buyers, including myself. If I had had a broker, I wouldn't have done that. What's the characteristic most important to succeed in business? Um, obstinance and the ability to get back up, no doubt about it. Barbara is gonna answer your social media questions in our final segment, we'll be right back. We're back with Barbara Corcoran. Her book is Shark Tales, How I Turned $1,000 into a Billion Dollar Business. She's an extraordinary lady, very successful, very pretty, and I'm not so sure what I believe her about the bit. Anyway, <laughs> uh, social media, Alfred Mole, LALA. -L -A. How much money do the sharks have combined? Mm, don't know that. I haven't done that math. I would come, I would say probably in the area of $4 billion. Capella Marie, how do you find good mentors and investors? by offering to do something for someone for free. I'm asked to be a mentor every day of the week. I never say yes. But if someone says, hey, can I do this for you and this and this for you? And I'm not even gonna charge, I always invite them in the office and before you know it, they're working for me. You gotta give before you get. Oscar Musatev, how can an 18 year old start a company for himself? First of all, you have to know you're made for having a business, okay? Are you meant to be an entrepreneur? Can you sell? Can you push? How aggressive are you? Assuming that is all said, if you feel passionate about it and you don't have the money, you can convince somebody to give you the money. It's all about passion and communicating it and being able to sell the passion. You have to like what you're doing, right? Uh, you know, no one who builds a business likes it all the time. There are really terrible, terrible times, but you have to really be able to envision who you want to be and really believe you're going to get there, and that's what gets you through the bad times. Are entrepreneurs born or made? Hmm. I personally think most of them are born, and most of them have come through something bad as a child and have something to prove. Most entrepreneurs are insecure. Most entrepreneurs work very hard because they're filling something else up. They're not always the most healthy people in the world, but they sure are extreme. At Kiki Holloway, what advice would you have given yourself 10 years ago? I would have 
told myself easily, don't be intimidated. I spent two years on Shark Tank being scared to death. What was I really? doing? Really? Absolutely. Most of the shots that you would see me in in season one or two, I looked like an executive secretary taking excellent notes. I, was a, I spoke up, got mowed over, couldn't speak up loud enough, and was certainly uncertain about everything I did. And then somehow in season three, I decided I didn't care enough to be nervous anymore, and I kind of came into my own. Yeah, you have to, so I don't think I answered your question. What was that question again? Uh, the question was, what yeah. advice would you have given yourself 10 years Oh, yeah, let it go. As long as you're trying your best and you're being yourself, people are going to accept you. There's something I'm going to ask you early, I'll ask you. Of the sharks, who's the funniest? Oh, Damon John. I would say two-thirds of what Damon John says on set gets edited out. It's owned by Disney. He is so funny. Easiest to persuade? Uh, Mark. He's got billions. You ask him for, hey, Mark, go in here with me, and you put up 500000 It's like asking him for $2. He's, he goes right in. The one you'd turn to for advice? Uh, well, I use Mark to do all my math, because I'm not good at math. I go, could you give me those numbers, Mark? They cut that out of the edit, which is great. Um, but for actual advice, I would say Damon, because Damon is the most people-smart shark on the set. He has told me to go into, he has warned me on two deals, now, I'll go in with you, Barb, but the guy, no, he's not who we think, you think he is. That guy's no good, and he's been right every time. He's a great people judge. The most high maintenance. High maintenance shark? Robert, come on. We all come to Shark Tank with one outfit. Robert comes with 50, 50 shirts, 50 cufflinks, 50 ties. What do you think of this? What do you think of that? He drives us all crazy. He's high maintenance. Who's the life of the party? got to be you. Believe it or not, Mr. Wonderful. Get Mr. Wonderful with a glass of wine in his hand, mm -hmm. and you'll sit on his knee for five hours laughing like crazy at his stories. Do you have other projects in the work? Oh, God. I'm embarrassed to say no. All I do is work on Shark Tank and then work with my entrepreneurs when I'm not on Shark Tank and, of course, raise my family and work on my marriage, which is a waste of time. I've been working so hard for so long, it's not any better. <laughs> the Corcoran Group, are you proud of them? Do you look at their ads in the papers? They get written up a lot. They're always in the real estate. I'm not only proud of them, but I can't cut that ambivalent, whatever that quote is Bilical. from you, Billy. Thank you. Uh, but it's really a little odd. So when I pass a shop and the flowers aren't fresh, I won't embarrass the manager and go in and say, why aren't your flowers fresh? But I'll have them replaced after hours because I can't stand the fact that everything's not perfect. I'm a perfectionist and I wanted everything to just continue. Exactly so. And are there pitfalls to wealth? There are a lot of pitfalls to wealth, but I'd rather be wealthy than poor because I've been in both places. Uh, the pitfalls to wealth is uh, your friends are less genuine. You second guess motives. Um, it's harder to raise a great kid when you're wealthy than when you're not wealthy. It's harder to instill good values and not have a privileged child with attitude. Um, you, it's harder to make new friends because the ones you truly trust are your old friends. Yeah, there are a lot of complications with wealth. It's not what it's cracked up to be, but again, I said I'd rather be wealthy. Yeah. Is inherited wealth tougher in a sense? In that inherited wealth is terrible, and let me tell you why. My whole career, I worked with wealthy people buying apartments in New York. I would say three quarters of the people I worked with inherited the wealth, and there's something terrible about it because most of the people didn't feel like they deserved it or earned it. And if you think about the greatest satisfaction, anything we all do, is to feel like you've worked at something and gotten it yourself. And that's not allowed if you've inherited wealth. It's a mistake to enable your children. Well, I'll say it in theory, but what am I going to do with my two kids? One's 10, one's 22. We'll go to the right schools, etc. So I'm just like every other wealthy lady out there. I'm giving them everything they need. So you'll have to ask me a few years to see how they turn out. So far, so good, but not so easily done. Thanks, Barbara. It's always great seeing My you. My pleasure, Larry. Thanks to the delightful Barbara Corcoran, Shark Tales, How I Turn $1,000 Into a Billion is available now. And as always, you can find me on Twitter at King's Things. And I'll see you next time. On Larry King Now, Shark Tank's Barbara Corcoran. Truthfully, every great thing that happened in my business that pushed me ahead like a few years over my competition uh, was always after belly flop. I spent two years on Shark Tank being scared to death. What was really? I doing? Really? Absolutely. Most of the shots that you would see me in in season one or two, I looked like an executive secretary taking excellent notes. And then somehow in season three, I decided I didn't care enough to be nervous anymore. And I kind of came into my own. Is Kevin really a bad guy? He's a great actor. And you know what? He plays that part terrifically, and he makes the rest of us look like nice people. I mean, what would we do without Kevin on this show? He's essential. Plus, were you and Donald Trump rivals? 
rivals. He was my uh, best supporter, as I was for him. All right, the obvious, what do you think mm -hmm. of his run? If someone had told me to take that seriously a year ago, like so many other people, I would have found it laughable. Uh, but now I see that what he's doing in this run is exactly what he did best, building his business. He's building a brand. I'm trying to figure it out. Do you like him? I do I like him. Is there an honesty meter here? All next on Larry King Now. Welcome to Larry King Now. Our special guest is Barbara Corcoran, real estate mogul, business expert, and one of the stars of ABC's Emmy-winning series, Shark Tank. Her book is Shark Tales, How I Turned a Thousand Dollars into a billion dollar business. You only had a thousand dollars. A thousand dollars then was a lot of money. That's like 10,000 now. What, what, did you do it for real estate? I used the thousand dollars to start a real estate company. I was a waitress and got a lucky break because a guy came into the diner, gave me a ride home, he became my boyfriend. And six months later, he said, a girl like you would be great in real estate sales. Why don't you try that? And I did. And that's how I got started. What happened to him? <laughs> um, he was my business partner and my partner for seven years and then he ran off with my secretary. And uh, that was a hard chapter. But of course, uh, things happen for a reason and that got me in business for myself. And he ran off with the gift? He did, but that's okay because he gave me a gift going out the door. He told me I'd never succeed without him because I decided to end the business after a year. And uh, it was kind of like an insurance policy. I and felt like I was gonna succeed. I have been married a long time, two 22 years. 22 years, yeah, to Bill Higgins, yeah. And what does your husband do? He drives me crazy mostly, okay? He never <laughs> listens to me. He's the only person I can't boss around. He. Uh, how, I don't even know how to describe him. And sadly, as badly as I treat my husband, everybody calls him poor Bill. They should be calling me poor Barb, but that's <laughs> what's called a marriage. So how did Barbara Corcoran become Barbara Corcoran? I'm the first time I met you years ago, and you were like the real estate queen of New York. Yes. How did that happen? Well, it happened in the same way every business happens. I worked my buns off every day of the week from the moment I started the business at 23 until I sold it at 50. And I think if you work really, really hard and you're really dedicated and focused, you uh, build a business. Isn't there still a Barbara Corcoran Realty? There's a Corcoran Group Realty, which is the business I founded, and it's doing phenomenally well. So I'm very, but you're not very involved happy. with them? I'm not involved because I sold that business 22 years ago. But think about this. I cashed out. If I hadn't cashed out on that, where would I get the money to invest on Shark Tank? <laughs> <laughs> Do you still sell real estate? Oh, not at all. No, I've invested in 